everyone. I'm Ginger Spitzer, the Executive Director for One in Tech, which is ISACA's foundation. We'd like to introduce, now our foundation's been around a couple years, but we're really starting to introduce ourselves now. We're calling it a bit of a reintroduction because we've changed a little bit of our focus to be more strategic. So I'd like to go over that with you. Um, it, for the learning objectives for this session, what we'd really like to be a key takeaway is just kind of understanding our vision, our mission, and our purpose of the foundation, but also being able to share that with your chapters or other members, things that may come up, or even your companies as we have some corporate, um, corporate programs starting to be developed. Um, so again, you know, learning the new strategic objectives, which I think will be really well aligned, especially with the She Leads Tech, with all your interests. Um, and understand how she, One in Tech is really re-strategizing re to be a service of membership. We're a benefit to ISACA members. So it's not so much that we're a separate nonprofit that's kind of related to ISACA. We are your foundation. Um, and then the last takeaway would be if you're interested in finding opportunities to get involved with the foundation. So let me tell you a little bit about us. So I think preaching to the choir here in terms of awareness of what some of the issues are that, that the foundation is concerned with addressing. Um, the statistics on the demographics of cybersecurity professions illustrate a major cause of this great workforce shortage. So there's this gap, right? I think they say there's something like um, over 3 million cybersecurity jobs will go unfulfilled globally um, in the next year. So the reason or one of the, the solutions to that is tapping into the talent that is already excluded in the pipeline of cybersecurity workforce. So, and that's a number of things. You, know, you look at the underrepresented populations within the cybersecurity field, clearly women. Women are, I believe, you know, 51% of the global population and I think about 24% of, of cybersecurity job holders. I may be mixing up my stats. I think it may be a little bit lower than that, and they're 24% uh, in the tech fields. And then cybersecurity is even lower than that. Um, but we also have, at least here in the US, uh, uh, you know, so many barriers and biases for, um, based on racials, ra racial profiles. Um, so the, uh, I think black, um, there's 9% of, uh, blacks in the uh, cybersecurity fields. What do we have? I didn't put my reading glasses on, so you see me squinting like a crazy person. Um, Hispanics, 4%, and um, Asians, 8%. Uh, so those are all increasingly low um, representation in these cybersecurity fields. And yet at the other end, we have perf uh, companies clamoring um, for talent. They're like, oh my gosh, we have a shortage. Well, maybe you should look over here where all these people have been left out and you won't have that. So it's logic, right? We're not even preaching some complex theory here. This is logic. So yes, having equity, inclusion, diversity is, is all about human rights and fairness, but guess what? It's a really good business decision as well. So that's really the premise of One in Tech, ISACA's foundation, is to foster this diversity for a number of reasons. Our mission is, we have a vision, mission, and our purpose, all related, but the mission is to provide underrepresent, underrepresented individuals with opportunities to enter cyber professions and to support the advancement of these people into the leadership positions. And I'll talk a little bit more about those two, kind of the entry level or the uh, what we'd like to say is attract talent, and then the advancing or accelerating those talents into, into leadership. So we're gonna take, the foundation has kind of really been more strategic in the last year in our planning, and we said, let's 
define the roles that the foundation can take, completely aligned with ISACA's role of building a, a great digital trust industry. And what are the roles we'll play? Well, uh, ISACA has been extraordinarily supportive, and they said, we will fund, let's fund um, the professional development and education by launching this global scholarship program. To me, this was like, you know, hearing the, the songs from the from heavens <laughs> saying, we're going to actually do something super direct, real. We're going to give funding to college students or students in university, as well as people already in the fields to enter them into the, the pipeline of cyber workforce and to advance them through that pipeline into leadership roles. So that was a big deal, and you're gonna hear a lot about that. The, the next one we're going to do is connect. We're in a perfect situation to connect the leaders who can advance this on a more systemic or, or more um, kind of create this ecosystem of uh, diversity building initiatives. And so the foundation a little later in the year is really looking to start a global alliance or maybe a global coalition, something where we can have a really high arching um, vision or goal that organizations, corporations, ISACA chapters, uh, people around the world can all get into and say, let's move that needle forward as a large, powerful group, rather than all these kind of little groups doing different things. So that's our connector role. And then um, the, the last one is one you're probably all familiar with. We'd like to accelerate careers through our She Leads Tech program. So the She Leads Tech program, 100% we care about attracting women to the field of cybersecurity, and that will never go away. But some of our core work in the next few years is gonna be focused on advancing women into leadership roles. They're already in the space, but they're facing those barriers and blockages that are keeping them from getting to management positions or even C-suite roles. And so that's really gonna be a strong focus of our She Leads Tech. And of course, we have our, our wonderful speaker here today that she's, she, uh, her, you know, her talents and her, her expertise are just an example of what will be um, connecting the ISACA members and others with to be able to help them rise into leadership roles. At the same time, just to add more, is um, our funding, our scholarships are going to be part of that She Leads Tech program as well. So I want to tell you a little bit about our scholarship program, which I'm super excited about. Um, uh, you know, again, this is, we really have two tracks of scholarships. And while my slides haven't quite caught up to the language that I'll be using today, everything is like we're developed, Holly and I are in the back room, like building the airplane while we're flying it. But um, you, you'll see that we have some really good things already going on. Um, so again, you know, these are just the facts that, that most people here already know. There's, you know, the, the cybersecurity and IT audit fields are quickly becoming one of the most important um, areas, career fields, to be able to, um, to enter. And so we need to help accelerate people into those. Um, so our scholarships really will bridge that gap. The scholarships are, um, and here, here's kind of the criteria around them, or their purpose is to serve populations that are historically underrepresented and currently underrepresented in tech careers. So it may be gender, culture, race, and other aspects. Sometimes it depends on the country, right, or even the region, what is that particular underrepresentation. Um, we're gonna build the pathways for those, for those people to enter the field. We're gonna support them through academic scholarships and professional development scholarships. Um, and all of our sc academic scholarships will include a career building bundle. And these are ISACA resources. So even more philanthropic pro provisions by ISACA. So this may include free training material. It may be um, some sort of certification uh, scholarships. Uh, it may be um, all, you know, mentoring, connecting with ISACA and all those type things. 
So again, this is, this is really kind of what I talked about, and a lot of this will have to do with the whole premise of a career building bundle is don't just give somebody a scholarship and then wave goodbye. That's not very longitudinal. What we want to do is plug these individuals into, a, again, this ecosystem and this lifelong path of learning so that their careers are strong and they're not just kind of thrown into the waters and then asked to kind of swim alone amidst that. Getting into the career is only part of the, the challenge. So one of our scholarships that's super exciting is um, with Ms. Belinda Noma, who is here as our keynote speaker, and we're giving away six scholarships that will offer, um, I believe it's four weeks of uh, professional coaching with her. And so we had a, a QR code up, and we're still taking applications, is that right, Holly? Um, so if you want to go ahead and the, the key is to either nominate somebody, somebody that you know is on a good pathway toward leadership and they could really use that, that support, or nominate yourself. This is a great way to, to kind of have a, a building block to your own careers. Um, so we're going to be choosing those winners, uh, those, those awardees at the end of, um, I'm going to sit down and take a look at all the applications with my colleagues and we'll be awarding those uh, at the end. And then She Leads Tech, again, all, many of you are so familiar with She Leads Tech and it's been a very, very strong program. And you've already seen my stats of why we need an organization like, or, or a program like She Leads Tech. It's definitely something that has already had a strong history, but we're looking to kind of make it a little bit more razor sharp in its outcomes. Um, a little more action oriented, not so much awareness oriented. Uh, let's see. So again, this is a new vision for She Leads Tech. It's not vastly different. It hasn't changed a, a whole lot of um, kind of uh, theory behind it. But what we do is we are building um, these toolkits and resources. Actually, um, Ms. Holly's in charge of building those, and she's doing an incredible job building really toolkits or um, learning modules that the chapters, ISACA chapters, use in order to share with their members. Now there are lots of elements of this that are also available directly for the individuals. Those could be things like the, um, you know, this session and, um, you know, doing different mentoring events and things like that. Um, so here are the offerings that, sh that services will include for She Leads Tech, and again, I mentioned the scholarship offerings. Um, st still having some live sessions and recordings. Keep in mind we're scaling up by having chapters provide, we're helping the chapters provide very specific types of events. There, we're doing the, the templates for them and the tip sheets and all the things that they may need to do the events in their own regions. That's a great way to scale up this mis mission. Um, also, certification resources. Uh, Holly's developed a power skill development, traditionally called soft skills, but that just doesn't sound right. These are power skills on how to advance professionally. Um, inclusion, inclusive learning, networking, she leads tech leadership roles will be available um, as they are now through ambassadorship and liaisons, um, and then mentoring opportunities as we partner with ISACA. So I think that wraps up my portion. Um, again, I'm very, very excited about the new direction of One in Tech and just so grateful for your interest and we're looking forward to keeping everybody informed of all the things that we're doing in the next year and on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ginger. Good morning and good day to everyone. Um, thank you those who are joining us virtually as well. I know I'm a, I speak loudly, I apologize. Um, my name is Holly Mays, and I am the Senior Program Manager for One in Tech, ISACA's Foundation. I am pleased to be here today. Thank you again, Ginger, for an awesome reintroduction 
to One in Tech. Um, we thought it incredibly important to share and make sure we communicate a new refocused vision um, so that everyone is aware. And as you all have been doing so awesomely throughout this conference, promoting our message and sharing our mission and making sure that it gets out there globally. And that goes for you too in the virtual audience, friends. Share the message. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce our She Leads Tech uh, Masterclass speaker, Ms. Belinda Enoma. Ms. Belinda, <clears throat> Ms. Belinda is a New York-based global speaker, coach, author, data privacy and cybersecurity professional with a legal and tech background, right? How's that? I could stop right here, okay? <laughs> Her extensive professional experience spans many nations, including the UK, Denmark, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. She is a certified information privacy professional with an LLM uh, from Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law in New York and her certificate from Harvard University in cybersecurity managing risk in the information age. In addition, Ms. Belinda is a digital entrepreneur and leadership strategy coach, a mentor to women, a mentor to women, a mentor to women, empowering people globally to utilize their zone of brilliance and impact their generation. Please help me welcome Ms. Belinda Enoma. Alrighty, friends, so we're gonna do a bit of a fireside chat. Um, women in tech, authentic allyship, and intentional leadership. So before we hop into the subject itself, tell the folks, I mean, I, I gave your resume, <laughs> right? Tell the folks a little bit about yourself and do your own introduction, like what did I miss? You didn't miss anything. <laughs> I think you did a good job, actually. Thank you. Thank you. When you were talking about me, I was like, is that me? <laughs> wow, that's me, you know? So I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm just um, excited to be here. And um, it, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, to be able to, to speak at this event and to empower women and to talk to, to help us get to where we need to be. It's it's, it's great, I'm excited. Absolutely, so um, I have a, a bit of a hard question, unprepared, sorry. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> you chose this topic. Why is it important to you? What, what in your experience, what in your, in your journey to who you are and where you are today, what made that important to you? It is extremely important because when you look at it, I have been in different organizations where I am the only person who looks like me. Whether it's leadership, whether it's um, junior role, entry level role, many situations where you don't get to see people who look like me. Mm. And representation matters, extremely important. The other day I was listening to something that Viola Davis said. Somebody asked her the question, so why does representation matter? And she said something in the lines of, you've got to see the physical manifestation of your dream. You've got to see the physical manifestation of where you want to be. You get to see people watching me now, online and here, you're seeing me. There are many people who would, who would never think that they would see somebody who looks, like, who looks like me here. So they're watching online, seeing a physical representation of what they aim to be. And that's why I'm here. Absolutely. We were, um, I was just speaking to one of the ISAGACON conference task force members, Nikki, and um, name check. <laughs> um, but we were talking about how it was important to, again, representation mattering because when we were coming up, um, even in undergrad, right, taking a, a computer science course, mm -hmm. it was just about 
learning how to produce a website. I didn't right. know that security was a lane that you could travel in tech, right? right. I did not know that that was a, a, a branch that could be explored. I imagine working at ISACA now that I would have been excellent at it. <laughs> However, you know, we have a responsibility now that we know that we have untapped, unrepresented populations in our field to bring it to them. You know, uh, what is it? Ah, you have to bring it, bring the, bring the horse to the water, right? right. <laughs> Essentially, right? right? right. Um, so one of the things in, um, in the last year or so that I've been running program for um, One in Tech and specifically She Leads Tech and ISACA's mentoring program, one of the first things I always see women put in the chat or raise their hand, because most of it's been virtual, um, one of the first things they always say is, women work twice as hard as men to get, them to get, the, to get half of the accolades. Right. Um, what do you think continues in 2022 to contribute to that and what are your methods or ways, or am I front selling your keynote a little bit later to kind of combat that? And, and especially not just, not only for corporations, but for women to understand that you don't have to do that, right? You don't have to work twice as hard. What, what, what do you have for the folks? That's interesting. <laughs> Because, yes, we work twice as hard. It's just, it's a fact. It's not fiction. Mm -hmm. We work twice as hard. And there has to be a cultural shift. Because what's happening is there is the notion that women, we, you know, we're nurturing, we, you know, endearing. It's just tradition, you know? Certain things about us. And there is the perception that certain things come to us easily, even though it's almost killing us. There's a perception that we can do this, we can, we can multitask, we can, yeah. You know, there's lots of people who are, like for example, mothers. I am a mother of three children. And when there was small, it was difficult, extremely difficult to, you know, to focus on raising a family and also your career and everything that you've got to do and then you've got to work and then if you have a long commute, like I had a long commute, door to door was like two hours or two and a half hours one way and then you've got to like run to daycare, drop your kids off and then the daycare is calling you while you're at work that, oh, your child's got fever and you're running, I've got to do this and I've got to, you know, get back and then you're trying to like coordinate with your spouse whether he can get there before you and everybody's running around running crazy and we're working twice as hard. So there has to be a cultural shift and that cultural shift has to happen in the workplace as well. And it goes down to leadership because when leadership understands that the people that are working with you, for you, in your team, that they're human beings, we are human beings, you know? The human beings, they've got responsibilities, they've got families, they've got different things that they're struggling with. Even the leaders, leaders themselves are struggling. So if you as a leader, you see yourself, that you've got all these things that you're struggling with as well, rest assured, the people that are working with you, they too, they've got issues. They've got things that they're struggling with. So going back to your question, how do we change this fact? There has to be a cultural shift. It trickles from the top. I've heard this saying that the, the fish rots from the head. It goes down to the bottom. So there has to be a cultural shift. It starts from the top, because when there is a change in the top, it trickles down and Absolutely. everyone will understand. That, you know what? You don't have to work twice as hard because you're a woman. I understand what you're going through. I understand you know, what's happening you know, in, in your life. So we gotta make some things, we gotta shift some things, we gotta change some things in the workplace. Absolutely. Something's gotta give. Absolutely. So it starts from the top. It has to be a cultural so, shift. So let's get specific, let's get specific. What specifically can enterprises do to help women with work-life balance? I'll, I'll take some low-hanging fruit. You talked about childcare. Why not provide, especially for larger corporations, 
provide childcare on site or uh, transportation to and from, or some sort to kind of lighten that load, lighten, lighten, um, remove that barrier. What other things could corporations, enterprises do specifically to lighten the load? Right. It's important flexibility. Ooh. You've got to give people flexibility. Flexibility. Because if they're getting the work done, if we're doing the work, then, you know, give us some flexibility. Understand that. Now, if you have on-site child care, that works for some people. Mm -hmm. But if you have to commute, you don't want to drag your kid two hours or two and a half hours to the job, to the workplace. However, you would appreciate some flexibility either working remotely. Fancy that. Working remotely and, you know, come into the office whenever you're needed for meetings, whatever you need to do. Allow flexibility because happy employees, we're going, but we're going into my keynote now. I'm not going to talk too much. Okay, okay. Fair let's, enough. let's leave that. Fair enough. Because you want happy employees. So allow some flexibility it's extremely important, flexibility, because when your people are not happy, when your staff's not happy, and you know, there's a saying, the mama ain't happy, nobody happy. So Listen. if your people, the people you're working with, they're not happy, they're going to plan to leave, and they will eventually leave, perhaps, to your competitor, and you don't want that. Ooh. <laughs> so um, in terms of the job and, and on-site support, I'm... Uh, thinking about mentorship, sponsorship, um, what types of things could enterprises do or programs could they institute on site to help, um, again, lighten that load, but also bring others, uh, like you said, speak to that human speak to the humanity and, 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 and foster that understanding amongst all co-workers, regardless right. of race, creed, gender, whatever, of accepting humanity and supporting and um, fostering respect for your co-worker. Because, you know, in my mind, the fact that a woman has to work twice as hard, if a woman is feeling that, she's also feeling a level of disrespect oh, yeah. in the workplace, right? You're also feeling unseen you're also feeling unheard if you have to work that hard so what types of things can enterprises do to combat that and the, to combat that and those feelings okay so one thing that they can do is something like this for example mm. something like this is extremely important it is great your employees want to be empowered you have yes. to empower your staff yes. empower them people going through all kinds of issues whether at home, in the workplace, you've got office politics, you've got people talking and all kinds of things happening in the workplace. People need to be empowered because sometimes when we talk about cybersecurity, the first thing people think about is just, you know, tech and hacking and all that. But there is the human factor of cybersecurity. There are human beings behind this whole thing that we're doing here. We are humans after all. And we have things that we struggle with. And I keep going back to things that we struggle with. So you need to um, empower your staff and, and hold meetings like this, really important. You know, they don't have to be large scale, they could be small scale. It doesn't matter, you know, what the people believe in or, or gender, just get the people together, empower them, speak to, to, to the humanity and, and their wellness because people are really struggling. And a lot of people don't talk about it. They come into work, they do their jobs, they do their stuff, they don't talk about it. And then you're wondering, maybe a few weeks later, they quit. And you're like, what happened? Because as a leader, you don't even know who works, with you, who works for you. You don't even know who's working with you. You don't even know their child's name. You don't even know what they're dealing with because you're not approachable. Not approach? Come on, Belinda. <laughs> The folks in the ivory tower, that's, that's the whole point. Why be approachable, right? No, um, so another thing that comes to mind that is really a bug in my craw <laughs> as we are down south um, is the fact that, you know, when we talk about marginalization in the workplace, oftentimes 
they put the onus of combating that on the marginalized, right? So they say women aren't feeling, Belinda, go ahead. Um, women aren't feeling empowered. And so they say, let's teach them how to be assertive. How many un unassertive women do we have in the room? Raise your hand. Yeah, right, no hands raised. <laughs> audience I know some of you are sitting at home like I'm not afraid to use my voice I'm not afraid to speak up and lobby for myself so it's clear that you know that might not be the answer for everyone so my question to you is two-part how can we get enterprise and our allies and support systems to really shoulder this responsibility of affecting gender balance in digital trust, right? How can we get um, folks to understand that they are a part of the solution? They are not passive um, folks to just, you know, go along to get along with whatever the next trend is or the next woke trend is. How can we get allies, enterprise, actively involved in dismantling these barriers? Well, <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> well, enterprises, leaders, everyone here, we've got to be intentional about your allyship. It's got to be authentic allyship. Not surface allyship, it's got to be authentic. And the reason why I mention it being intentional allyship is because a lot of times people think that, oh, I'm an ally, you know, I support, you know, trying to um, um, get diversity higher, trying to get a, a black woman in a certain role or a black male or, you know, other races into a certain role and you're just checking the box. But that's surface allyship. We want intentional allyship. We want authentic allyship. Because one thing that we need to really understand is that it goes beyond just the person who you're helping. You're helping a generation, not just one person. You're helping, when you're authentic about your allyship, and you, you're intentional about it. You think that you're just helping that employee or the individual that's right in front of you. But check this, that individual has got a family, perhaps the individual has got a family or, or, or a generation of people after that person. So you're really not just checking the box, you're impacting destiny. So it's really important that as an ally, that when you're intentional about your, your allyship, you think beyond the person that's right in front of you. You think beyond the job application. You think beyond what you see. Think beyond that because you're impacting destiny. It's not about you, but it's what you're doing for the person and that person's generation to come. So you've got to really think about the step that you're going to make when it comes to allyship, not just surface, not just saying, you know, I'm an ally and I support this, but you've got to really make impact and not just talk, but implement. Because one thing is we talk, but we don't implement. Ooh. So we got to activate and then we got to implement. And then we follow up. Don't just implement and leave them there. Follow up. How are you doing? Do you know anybody else we can bring in? You got to open the door from inside intentional allyship open the door from inside a lot of doors are shut mm. they're not open mm -hmm. and you can easily open that door so let's make an effort and be intentional about it and that's what i'll say for that for absolutely now. oh my word so um the, I, I wanted to reiterate the difference between um and you can google it authentic allyship versus performative allyship and you mentioned something so important because, uh, you know, how many times have we worked for an organization that says, oh, we want feedback from our employees. We want to hear what you have to say. And you're like, oh, they do? And so you go in and you participate wholeheartedly and you're like, oh, I'm giving all the great feedback. And then nothing. It lands nowhere. 
enterprise, if you're listening, we need it to go somewhere. We need that intentional, intentional? action. Follow up. Follow up. Buzzwords, friends. Um, implement. Gotta, um, <laughs> implement. I did forget one. So uh, ask for the feedback. Receive it. Uh, follow up and implement. We got those for those who are taking notes. I love buzzwords, friends. All right, we have a couple uh, questions for the audience. So first, R. Holloway, an ISACA volunteer, um, asked, a, asked a question, and I just want to make sure I acknowledge it because I think we, we kind of answered it. Um, the question is, I've noticed there's a greater need for sensitivity needed by enterprises. Can you provide suggestions for assisting better collaboration between colleagues? And so I think we kind of talked about that a little bit. Do you have anything that you would like to add in answer to that question? Okay, so can they elaborate on sensitivity? What kind of sensitivity? Well, R. Holloway, if you are listening, please elaborate. I am here in the chat uh, looking at your answer, so we'll come back to that. Okay. Fantastic. So, R. Holloway, what do you mean by sensitivity? Or if there's anyone else out there um, who has some ideas about that, please feel free to share them in relationship to this question. I'll move on to the next. How do you move on a culture with no understanding of diversity? And so I'm assuming that this question, if I were to dig a little deeper, is about how do you um, create empathy and, uh, and, and, and highlight the need for diversity and inclusion and equity in a position? Okay, so the question that they posted is how how do you move on a culture with no understanding of diversity of, divi of diversity diversity okay so there's several ways one way of doing that is I'll, I'll share a little story for yes, example please so um there was an event that was happening um this was sometime last year and somebody that had i haven't met her yet and, but she's a LinkedIn connection. She sent me the information. And it was a program that was promoting, um, that was promoting diversity. And it was a, a program where you have to, you're paired, you're paired with somebody, um, you're, pa you're paired with an ally who doesn't look like you oh. to help promote you oh. on their platform. Okay. And it was quite interesting because the person who sent it to me does not look like me. And I've never met her, but I've spoken to her. I've, you know, I've, well, I've met her virtually, right. and I've spoken to her, but I've right. not met her in person, physically. You know? And it was quite interesting. I was touched, I was excited, because I was like, oh my goodness, you know, she really, you know, she, this is a fantastic person. So I'm sharing that story, because if you're thinking that, you know, I don't know anything about diversity, I don't know anybody, you know, I want to, do my part, but I don't know how to do it. That's an example. Connect with people who don't look like you, who don't talk like you, who don't sound like you. Connect with them and have conversations. Go beyond just connecting and not saying anything. You know, you can have virtual coffee these yes. days. Yes. Connect with people, talk to people, and you'll be amazed at what you will learn. You'll be amazed that uh, you, you will, you'll see the differences and, and you have conversations and you, get a, you start to understand where people are coming from. So don't just stay in, I would say, in isolation and just saying, I don't mm. know what to do. I don't know anybody. Or I, I, don't, you know, I don't understand anything about diversity. There's a lot of information out there these days that you could just Google it and, and see for yourself. But one thing that is really effective is connecting with people. Yes. Connect with people. Make an effort. Be intentional about your connections. Be Absolutely. intentional about connecting with people. Connect with me. If you don't like me, connect with me. That's all right. <laughs> and that's I think why. that's. And I thank you for highlighting that because I think that that's super important, especially in this much, much more virtual age. We don't get a lot of us don't get the uh, uh, are afforded the ability for that water cooler conversation any longer, where you do find out the next thing that's going on with someone's kids or what someone might be struggling with. And so you do have to be a lot more intentional about how you connect with folks. And I have had, I think it's, it's awesome how technology um, has 
said, you know, you can have this 15 minute slot for a virtual coffee. Or um, I will say at ISACA, at ISACA, they're creating more opportunities for us to connect even after our large staff meetings. There's a, a 10 minute breakout room session where there's a discussion prompt and you are randomly assigned. And so you meet people from all across our lines of business at iCycle, which has been a welcome feature to, um, to get to know folks that you wouldn't normally meet because we're also spread out in this you know virtual age so absolutely you have to be a lot more intentional um and dedicated to it like i yeah. listen i'm a nerd i i love learning about people and their stories because that's what makes them tick um i have noticed that when you learn about people they're more invested in you more invested in the work um and I'm seeing a lot of head nods, and it's not lost on me that women know that. Yeah. Women already know that, right? It's a little bit intuitive, but it's important for enterprise and for colleagues and for allies to truly embrace. Um, so I have another, I have a couple more questions. I think we're just gonna stick with the chat for the rest of our time together here. Um, so what do you uh, think are three key steps to moving forward and minimizing cultural biases. Okay. Okay. Well, don't get me started now. Listen, <laughs> you asked for three. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to get three. You might get one major one. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. So an important step, it goes back to leadership. I just keep going back to that because I know that if change is going to happen, those who are in leadership roles have to be bold enough to say, I am going to be a change agent and I'm going to shift the dynamics of this organization, of an, of an organization, and the way the culture is there. Because whether you like it or not, there are people there who are marginalized, who are not happy. You will not hear about it because I, I mentioned before, I said, you're not approachable. Mm. So you got to be approachable. Leaders, you got to be approachable. And when you're approachable and people are telling you that, you know, um, making suggestions and recommendations, you got to actively pursue them. Be intentional. I keep going back. Intentionality is so necessary. So how do you minimize this? It starts from the top. And also, among team members, got to make an effort among team members. Mm -hmm. The things that, that some team members may say that may affect somebody who looks like you, or yes. who looks like me. Yes. But we won't say anything because we're like, oh, here we go again. We just keep quiet, and then we're like, okay, that's somebody to avoid. I'm not going to have this conversation mm -hmm. with that person because I ain't got time for this. You know, things like that happen. So you got to, like purposefully understand that there are things that you could be saying that will affect somebody else. Yes. It doesn't always have to be race. It could be gender. It could be faith, religion, Ability. whatever it is yep. that you could say that could affect somebody else. And then sometimes the person saying it is totally unaware. Mm -hmm. Not being vindictive, but just totally unaware that they've said something that's offended the other person. But then again, it goes back to the team. I'm, I'm, I'm dressing teams now, not just leadership. It goes back to the team. When you are offended, I encourage you to speak up. I encourage you to speak up. Don't stay silent because the longer you, you stay silent and hold it in, one day you're going to be like, oh, my Lord, this you is going to like, yeah, you that's just it. Explode. Yeah. yeah, it's going to come out. So speak up. If somebody offends you, there's nothing wrong with telling the person, that, oh, what you said. That Absolutely. Was, that wasn't right. You know, speak I would up. like to add to that not only intentionality, accountability. Yes. That's what you're talking about, accountability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the, the key things... Uh, that I like in the conversation about allyship is learning how to apologize. Yeah. Um, whether we like it or not, all of us in some way, shape or form have biases. Mm -hmm. Every last single person 
That's just a human condition. But acknowledging and learning how to apologize and learn from and being accountable for what it is you know and learning what you don't know, right? right. And what's that uh, Oprah always said, that her favorite Maya Angelou quote, when you know better, you do better. That's right. And so if I were to put onus, because I, I, it, it's putting onus on the marginalized is, yeah, drives me nuts. However, if I were to put onus on the marginalized, it would be to speak up. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a crucial. And I'll share a little story yeah, about sure. that. A little story about that speaking up. So once upon a time, Belinda was working somewhere. <laughs> Once upon a time, I was chatting with somebody, a colleague, and the colleague used a wrong emoji. Uh -oh. mm -hmm. She used the wrong emoji. And I said to her, I was chatting with her, and I said to her, I said, wrong emoji. I don't know whether she'd ever seen my picture before or whatever it was, but, you know, because it was virtual stuff that we're doing. I said, wrong emoji. And she was like, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, my gosh. I said, yeah wrong emoji and that was it and that was the end of that that never yeah. happened again because I spoke up I said wrong emoji in the moment in the moment and I, did, I, I didn't allow it to to you know drain me and and stay there and fester and and, and get upset I was upset but I was like uh-uh I'm telling her <laughs> I will have to say because I'm one of those ones I will eat it and it'll fester and I'm like I'm just brewing I have to tell you um I have begun to practice a little bit more assertiveness. I know that's weird, right? Because I'm holding a microphone. But I've begun to practice it and I feel a lot better. I don't internalize it. My mental and emotional health is better for it because I've spoken up in the moment. And regardless, and, and that's the other thing, is your expectation. Mm -hmm. Don't speak up to expect immediate change. Right. Speak up for you. That's it. Speak up to, because I think it's important to place the responsibility of someone else's growth on someone else. Don't carry that. That's not for you. That's not, that, as, as we say in church, that's not your ministry. <laughs> But speaking up, I think, speaking and speaking up. out, especially in the moment and correcting someone, I think will go a long way. I, sometimes I always say that um, marginalized folks don't work the same eight hours as other folks with privilege. Um, how many times have you written an email that should have taken five minutes, but you're going back and adjusting for tone? You're making sure that it's perfect because you don't want to be seen as incompetent because it's expected that you're incompetent as a woman or another person um, of a marginalized group. And so that five minute email has become a 25 minute email. Some folks don't work the same eight hours. So one of the ways that I've, uh, Maxine Waters, reclaimed my time <laughs> is to write, is, is to let that go, is to, right. not, is to not keep um, the things that have bothered me and to, yeah. to set them with the folks or the institutions or uh, vehicles where they lie. Right, right, right. Um, we have one last question because we're a little bit over time. And I know we have to get to break, but the one last question is, what are some specific intentional things that middle management can change from a leadership standpoint in a hybrid work environment? So I think in just in general, middle management, what, what, because that's kind of limbo, a limbo space that a lot of us are in, right? Um, what could middle management do? Well, you could recommend somebody. Mm. You could recommend somebody for a leadership role. You could recommend somebody to be in management because a lot of people, marginalized people, you, you find that they're at a certain level and it's very difficult to break through that level, not because you're not qualified. You're qualified and, and you're, able to, to get to what, you're able to get to where you should be. However, it's like a, a glass ceiling, this invisible glass ceiling mm -hmm. that is so difficult to break through mm -hmm. so you could recommend somebody 
you could recommend them to get to a higher level. And then if your middle management and, and somebody, your colleague or your team member is making recommendations or suggesting changes or certain things that can really um, elevate your group and, and get you to a higher level or to finish your um, your products or release whatever projects you're working on, mm -hmm. don't just dismiss it. Yes. Don't dismiss it. Pay attention to it because there's a reason why they're sharing that information with you. And if you play your role, do your part, then change is going to happen. And for the rest of that, and it looks like we've got a emergency alert of some sort for here in New Orleans, our tornado warning Never a dull day at Isaka, friends. <laughs> well, um, in about 15 minutes, we're going to have another tornado come through. <laughs> Belinda is going to give her keynote on the power of authenticity in the workplace. So we're going to take a short break and return back to the stage at 940 or from wherever you are, 40 past the hour or 20 minutes to the hour. Thank you very much for joining us for this first session. We hope you enjoyed.